Or Scully. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and it's a pleasure to serve under your stewardship. It's also a pleasure to um, follow two fellow members of the uh, Petitions Committee as well, uh, including the Chair, um, the member for Warrington North. Um, as we've heard, we're sort of feeling our way. We're feeling our way because it's a new, um, this is a, a new committee, the Petitions Committee. Uh, we've also heard that we're, um, uh, we can't debate no confidence motions. The petitions aren't able to uh, uh, seek the no confidence in, a, in a, a Secretary of State or anybody else. But nonetheless, it's important that we do reflect the views and the concerns of people that, that raise the substantive matters with us. And I'm glad that we have the opportunity to do so today. Um, and it is really important that we have the uh, uh, confidence with that and, and, um, a, a good staff morale within the NHS. I know in my um, area of Sutton and Cheam, our local hospital, St. Helier, um, morale there, for a number of reasons, has been uh, comparatively low uh, over several decades. Uh, we've had a reorganisation uh, recommended over the last couple of years, which we've successfully uh, fought off so far, um, where, we wanted, where the NHS uh, clinicians wanted to move um, A&E maternity services and children's services to St George's in Tooting. And one of the reasons that they wanted to do that was the uh, shortage of consultants within St Elliot. So they wanted to consult, concentrate consultants' time in St George's, uh, further away, which is just too far for residents. And what that meant was, one of the big driving factors for that, is, in my mind, is over 20 or so years, our local hospital has been used as a political football. Uh, people have said, St Helia Hospital, uh, it's, it's due to close. We've only got a short amount of time. We've got to save it. We've got to fight for this because it's going to be closing anytime soon. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was, uh, Madam Chair, but if I was a consultant looking to go and work in the NHS, would I want to go and work in a hospital that is always apparently under threat of closure? No, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably go to St George's or one of those hospitals that are being talked up. And so I've seen it firsthand how uh, staff morale within the NHS can be fragile. We've had it on a national basis as well. How many times have we heard that we've had 24 hours to save the NHS? We keep seeing this and hearing about this and reading about this time after time yeah, after time that's a good point. again. That's a good point. So it's important that we do build confidence, but we also have a manifesto commitment to deliver. We talked about having a seven-day NHS in our manifesto. Uh, we are here elected as a Conservative government, and it's important that we do deliver our, our promises. But we've got to work with the profession to be able to do that. And now why do we want the, uh, a 24-hour uh, NHS? Well, we've heard uh, some of the arguments about safety, uh, about patient outcomes, which at the end of the day is what it's all about, patient outcomes. There is also an argument, although the, uh, uh, my right honourable friend, the member for Totnes, uh, described about the fact that it is very much a secondary priority because we don't want to divert too much resources, but for convenience as well, for people's lifestyles, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, I think the 2003 consultant contract made the seven-day uh, move very, uh, a lot more expensive uh, to actually deliver. So we do need to change things. Consultants, as we've heard, can refuse to work weekends, but it's quite apparent that, you know, many, many people do not choose to opt out of this. So this isn't a broad brush uh, stroke saying that uh, every consultant opts out of that, just, but nonetheless, we need to have a degree of consistency if we're going to move towards a a, a seven-day NHS, because we want to make sure that hospitals throughout the country, the healthcare around the country, is consistent, uh, as consistent as possible. But removing the opt-out actually still leaves a new limit of being able to uh, work a maximum of 13 weeks in a year. That's one in four, one in four weekends, uh, which still gives plenty of opportunity for a family life, uh, for, for um, flexibility within uh, people's rotors as well, whilst delivering that wider and, and better patient outcome. We, um, the changes also uh, recognise have a proper reward for areas such as A&E and obstetrics as well, with higher performing consultants being able to earn a bonus of up to £30,000 per year, and also having faster pay progression for new consultants. And the uh, Honourable Member for Warrington North talked about support services, which it is crucial to have support services uh, to support those frontline consultants, doctors and nurses, 
And so I'm really pleased to hear that diagnostic services are going to be moving along the same, uh, same way as well, so that we can have, patients can have quicker access to information and advice about their conditions. I talked about convenience. Now, obviously, GP services can't be just boiled down to uh, some sort of retail operation like late night shopping or Sunday opening or something like that. But nonetheless, we do need flexibility. 2004 GP contract left 90% um, of GPs stopping giving out of hours care at night and at the weekend. It helped to break the patient's con uh, personal link between patients and the person who was res responsible for their care in many cases. And that was especially hard on elder elderly people as well. Caving to the unions at that point effectively restricted that GP service to a five-day service, which provided extra pressure on A&E. I've been to, I've had the misfortune of having to go to a &E service, user A&E services in my local hospital four times in the last 18 months. My elderly mum and my wife who managed to stand on a six inch spike in her park. Uh, and I know when she was writhing around in agony with her spike still th through a Wellington boot, there were a lot of people there that actually, uh, it was neither an accident nor an emergency for them. And that's because either they didn't know where to go, they chose not to go to the GP, um, or it wasn't signposted clearly enough, or the GP just simply wasn't open. These are pressures that we do need to tackle, and obviously through a seven-day service, we'll be able to help do that. But this is really part of our um, wider reforms on the NHS. The, uh, our, our NHS reforms since 2010 have really moved to bringing decisions uh, for the patient closer to the patient. We need to provide the service that the patient would want rather than a sort of Henry Ford uh, one-size-fits-all style. We do need greater facility, but we, uh, flexibility. And we've moved away from that largely, and we need to continue that move to, towards a seven-day service, towards greater flexibility. That's fitting in with working practices, people's working practices, childcare and busy lives. But along with uh, also greater digital take-up, from initiatives like the NHS National Info uh, Information Board and bringing um, uh, people in to help us support the greater use of technology. We've also we've heard from other members about the um, uh, some some of the statistics around satisfaction within the NHS over the last few years. The Commonwealth Fund uh, report in 2014, four years after the uh, Conservative-led government took over, showed us having. Um, according to their records, the, uh, the, uh, the best performing um, health service in 11 countries. Well, yes, I will. I'm very, I'm very grateful to give him way, but he must surely have read the detail of that particular uh, report by the Commonwealth Fund, and actually much of the data that was used uh, dates to the previous Labour government. <laughs> Also, that it's, it's also improved um, over those years from what I think we were second uh, earlier on when the Labour government was still in power. So we've actually, uh, we have actually still improved and there's still, there's still more data coming through. We've heard, we've heard, this is backed up though, the fact that public confidence has gone up 5% um, to its second highest level in that time. The number of people in England who think they're treated with dignity and respect have increased from 63% in 2010 to 76% according to Ipsos Mori last time. And record numbers say their care is safe. And the number who thinks the NHS is one of the best systems in the world has increased by 24% in the last seven years since mid-staffs. But, you know, this is a great base to start with. But we need to continue to work. And as I said at, right at the beginning, we need to continue to work with health care professionals to secure the seven-day NHS that we need and people want to see. Shouting and using the NHS as a political football really won't get you very far. Yeah. Um, he, he, he talks about the need to work with NHS staff. My constituent, who is a trainee anaesthetist, wrote to me in great, deal, uh, in great detail about her concerns about the impact of the proposed contract change. Um, and at the end of the, the email, she said this, as a final insult, Simon Stevens, Chief Executive of NHS England, has announced plans to pay for fitness classes for NHS workers to improve our health and reduce absenteeism. NHS staff are screaming out to be cared for so we can care for others by employing in 
enough of us on fair contracts with adequate resources to do our jobs well. Zumba will not achieve this. Um, whilst there's nothing wrong with employers um, investing in fitness classes um, for their employees, would he agree with me that in a crisis situation, this is simply adding insult to injury? I think one of the things that we... Coming back to um, the Secretary of State's um, uh, remarks at the, uh, I think it was King, the King's Fund speech that he gave, he was talking about actually working with professionals throughout September, through the, uh, working with the BMA and other organisations as well, and this is why we need to keep the dialogue going. And I, I've, I've seen nothing, actually, for, in, in substance, in speeches given by ministers that actually is um, launching itself in conflict with the vast majority of, um, of NHS staff. Um, so I think, you know, change management, change is always difficult, but change we must do, and we could achieve much more together. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, would the Honourable Member uh, agree with me that staff morale has been an issue for decades now? I've worked, you know, I've worked actually in, in your hospital, in your constituency, um, under the last Labour government, and what demoralises staff the most is the, the NHS being used as a political football. You know, yeah. members opposite are screaming, with our data. It isn't actually your data. It's patients' data. It's staff data. And we need to be working together. And I commend you in, in, your, in, in your remarks um, that we need to be working together and stop using the NHS as a political football. Yeah. We can, take, we can take every small initiative like the fitness classes and these sort of things and find offence in it because the NHS um, does have a, a limited budget. Um, people obviously, you know, staff, when they're looking at uh, whether there's a pay increase, what that pay increase might be, what those conditions are, 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 are if they're not happy with, uh, with what's on offer, they will tend to, uh, to, to find these examples. Um, but obviously I can't comment on that particular example. But I believe, just in conclusion, as I say, change management is always difficult, but we do need to change. And I really believe that we can achieve this under the calm, professional stewardship of the Secretary of State and his ministerial, his ministerial team. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.